Hello everybody. We're always late, aren't we? We are have at the you moment. have no idea how busy we've been this morning. <laughs> no lunch. <laughs> so I hope you're all well and you've had some lunch. That's really good if you have because you've got babies to feed and that's far more important. Um, so I uh, hope you've enjoyed the sunshine this week. That's been lovely, hasn't it? We are the infant feeding team. This is Alex. I'm Naomi, uh, infant feeding midwives. And uh, this session is for infant feeding as always. This is uh, well into our second year now. And uh, we have been doing this regularly for an hour on a Thursday at half past two, um, just to answer your questions. So things that worry you about feeding, uh, you know, you might have got some questions that, um, you, you know you don't know who to ask really because they're, they're not questions that are specific about concerns about your baby perhaps uh, you know your baby's gaining weight it's pooing and weeing but not quite what you're expecting or your baby's changed its feeding pattern you know and you're not really quite sure who to bother with those sort of questions that's exactly what this session is for and anything else as well so um Alex is having problems with her computer, it keeps it's, crashing. It's, it's been not a good day when it came to my computer. <laughs> you can always look on mine and do yeah. my, so. my um, uh, phone and look at questions. But we just can't <laughs> put our nose against the phone to answer your questions. Well, I did last, two weeks ago I had to. I was right up there, poor people, seeing me that so, close. So um, this session is not for anything to do with pregnancy or antenatal appointments or scans or tours around the delivery suite or whatever you, you know you you want to talk about it it because we we don't know always know the answer to all of those things because we don't work in those areas so uh, we might give you the wrong answer which is really not a very good idea um <laughs> and uh so there's uh ask the matron on a monday they had one last monday and the yeah. monday before so mm. perhaps they're going to have one this monday and as i well. like it's singular matron there's lots of them there were about four or five of them weren't there yeah there's a gaggle of them yeah. in front mm. of you aren't they um, so they're to ask, ask all those sort of questions about policies and visiting and guidelines and induction and all of that sort of thing um, because they make the decisions a lot of them and uh, so they know the most up-to-date information obviously. So um, we are anything to do with feeding at all. So if your baby is newborn or you haven't had your baby, if you're giving formula and or you're giving both or you're just breastfeeding and you've got any questions that are burning and your baby's two years old and you're breastfeeding, that's absolutely what we're here for. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we do have lots of very brilliant questions, really lively questions and sometimes really lively sessions. So, um, you know, we, we tend to end up with a theme, I think. I don't yeah. know whether it's planned like that, but, you know, <laughs> we start with one thing and then all the sort of questions are related to it and it's really brilliant. So, um, hopefully, um, You've still got equal numbers of wonderful questions to ask us uh, today and hopefully we can answer them all. Uh, the other thing is that you know our service is um, it's not an emergency service, uh, we're not 24 hours a day so if you have any concerns about your baby don't leave messages for us about concerns because we may not pick it up uh, for a while and uh, you know you want the answer as soon as you phone if, you know if you've got concerns so Help us to uh, um, Yeah, I was about to get this. You know, 111 is also uh, appropriate for that, or your GP surgery. I was going to find the care plan actually, because on the care plan. I think it's in there. On the care plan, it's got numbers that are 24 hours. So for any you know, of you. It's important that you phone those rather than phone us when we're not an emergency if service. If, yeah, if you're worried about your baby, if you're just phoning because you want to ask a question and it's not urgent, that's fine. So this is a postnatal care plan which you get when you've had your baby. And it's what you go home with for the, until your baby's discharged from midwifery care. And it's a brilliant little document. It has an awful lot in it and it's very helpful. Um, but on the front, it's got a list of telephone numbers. Now on those that list of telephone numbers, there are three that are 24 hours. So you've got um, the Banbury MLU, you've got Wallingford MLU, midwifery leg unit that means, and then the maternity assessment unit. So if it's the middle of the night and you're worried about your baby um, and you want to have a quick chat, it's not desperately urgent, but you want to have a chat with somebody, there will be someone manning the phones in all those three places. If you're worried about your baby, you think your baby's unwell, then it should be 111 or A&E. Um, but if it's a, you know, my baby's just done this, can I check it's normal, um, but it can't wait till tomorrow morning, then these are the, the numbers are on here. So Banbury, Wallingford or MAU, would be there'll be someone there 24 hours a day to answer your questions. And you know, a lot of those can be feeding related questions um, where you, you, if, you know, if your baby's just newborn and you can't attach, then you know, sometimes people do go in in the middle of the night and get help mm. there and then to breastfeed if they, if they have concerns. So, um, you know, it is, it's a really, really useful um, 
number to have. Mm. And so if you live in the south, you'd go Wallingford. If you live sort of Oxford to the south, Wallingford, and Oxford to the north, you'd ring yeah. um, Banbury. So, uh, so you know, it's equally sourced. And MAU, if you live in Oxford, is probably sensible, uh, or any of those other numbers, you can ring MAU. Yeah. So, um, you know, they're very happy to answer your calls. Uh, if you have got concerns but please don't leave us messages about concerns of your baby because um, we don't we're not here at four o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning um, we don't start till a bit later in the day and we go home at, at the end at the end of the evening so um, we don't pick up the calls for about 12 hours so um, you know it's important that you know who to call that's really important a good way of checking whether you think feeding's going well is in again in this care plan it's right near the back and it's pages, I never remember, is it six and seven? Which ones is it? No, no, 10 and 11 even. So this is a breastfeeding checklist. So the top page is for babies of 72 hours and under and the bottom page is for pa babies of 72 hours and above. So depending on how old your baby is, what you would do is you read down the question of what it's saying and then this is the answer. And if you're sitting everything in the green, you know you've done a great job. If anything is in the yellow, you need a bit more support. So it could be thing, something as simple as, you know, when the baby comes off the breast, your nipple is flat and ridged. So that's an indicator that things maybe aren't going quite as brilliantly as we hoped. So from that point of view, this is a really good self-assessment form. Now, your midwife may have filled it in for you, but actually we want you to be filling it in too. So have a look at it. As I say, the care plan is a really useful document. So on the first page inside, this is all about your birth. So if you want to know about how much blood you lost or um, when your baby was first breastfed, it will all be documented in here and the type of birth you had. The next two pages are our assessment of you. So this is you, and we're going to be talking to you, not us necessarily, but the, the midwives on the wards and your community midwives will be saying to you, you know, how are you feeling? Are your breasts comfortable? Um, how do your legs feel? Uh, you know, what do you, feel your uterus? Are you putting a wing? That's all in here. This bit obviously is way more what we get involved in because this is the baby. And this is a really good assessment. It looks at poos and wheeze and what the baby's up to and whether the weight's going up or down. So this is on this page. Then we move on to feeding assessment. Now this actually says on the top of this page, congratulations on the birth of your baby. So the plan is that you're filling this in and it talks about the stages that babies go through when they're learning to breastfeed. So babies don't always get it off straight off. Lots of babies don't. So it might be your baby's just licking around the nipple to begin with and that's the start of breastfeeding. That's how they're learning. So have a look, there's like four stages here. And then here you could put in what, what's happening feeding wise because it does get a bit blurry when you first have a baby and who's and wheeze get on that page too and then this is that someone's watched you breastfeed before you've gone out of the midwifery care and that someone's helped you hand express because that's your first aid and then we're on to plans to put in place so I see Naomi's checking her phone. Shall yeah, I we have some questions so shall I read out the first question yeah, go we've for got? it we'll roll uh, reversal. We can go back. so um We've got Jenny has uh, called and her baby is six months old and she's just developed mastitis, you poor thing, feeling awful with it. I bet you are. We say, if, you know, there's a £50 note on the floor and you get mastitis, you haven't got the energy to pick it up. So that's how <laughs> awful you feel. It's like being run over by a bus. And, and so, it's so if sudden. you're not sure if you've got it, you will know if you have got it. Mm. And yes, you, one minute you're OK and the next minute you Very can't sudden. move. So um, uh, I've started taking antibiotics. That's absolutely brilliant and I'm taking paracetamol but my GP said not to take ibuprofen as I'm breastfeeding but the NH website says I can what are your views you can also when will I start to feel better soon so milk removal you haven't mentioned milk removal so that's crucial as well make sure you're getting your baby on well um, and make sure you maybe if you need to you pumping as well just get that milk moving because Mastitis tends to be milk stasis, so it's milk that's in the breast not being removed. I don't know, your baby's six months old, was it? Yeah. So maybe your baby's just gone a bit longer than normal yeah, um, between food. feeds, um, and you, your breasts have just got a bit too full. And once you get that milk moving, you will feel so much better mm. really, really quickly. Mm. But there's no reason why you can't take ibuprofen unless you have asthma and it's contraindicated. From a feeding point of view, it is not contraindicated. Most of our mothers... Yeah, most of our mothers on the wards are taking ibuprofen, so yeah. no concerns on that one. And, um, you know, cool, cool Com um, yeah, compresses. compresses and warm compresses have a shower as well, warm shower, that sometimes you know, just gets the milk flowing. 
Um, but yeah, as Alex said, milk removal, you've just got to make sure you yeah. drain that breast because yeah. um, it's it's the um, inflammatory response in your breast that's making you feel so rubbish. Mm. And so if you take that inflammation away by removing it, then you, you can feel better. What then often happens um, is that when your breast fills again, you start to feel rubbish again. So that's why it's really important to to keep removing it because um, you know it, it comes when your breasts are full and it goes when your breasts are empty. Yeah. So effective milk removal, ibuprofen and antibiotics. Antibiotics are really, really good anti-inflammatory, so they will really help as well. Yeah. So hopefully with all of those things, and you can take paracetamol and ibuprofen, mm. um, you know, either back to back or together, um, whichever works for you. Um, but yeah, you should feel better within sort of 48 hours. You should start to feel much better. Yeah. But if you take good, good quicker than that, yeah, if you it? take good um, anti-inflammatories, then you, you will stop feeling quite so rubbish. Um, and but it takes a while for those antibiotics to work. Um, and don't stop mm. feeding. No, no, don't stop breastfeeding. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, so hello, Charlotte. Charlotte. Um, hi, she, ladies. Hi, she's had well. a birthday, isn't she? Hi. And uh, she's keeping safe in the last chat before we go on holiday. You're going to have such a lovely time. Oh, you're off to Fit Aventura, aren't you? Ah, lucky you. <laughs> I'm doing the last few bits of packing. Sorry, it may seem a silly question, but what do I get Alicia to eat while taking off to stop the ears popping? So if you're mm. breastfeeding, you can breastfeed, um, but we know you're not doing that. Um, but if, if there's any mums listening that are going on a plane, breastfeeding is brilliant mm. for the babies that are uh, taking off and landing. But um, I guess something chewy. So whether she can chew on an apple or um, pieces of apple or something like that. Because she's a big girl now, she's two. Yeah, so something that keeps her jaw, jaw going for a while, you know, something that makes her work quite hard. Does she like things like celery? Can you give her a stick of celery or something? Because that takes quite a bit of <laughs> chewing, doesn't it? Bring it out just as the plane's starting to take off and then, um, you know, it will balance mm. the ears out. But it's not easy. And, you know, we used to give out um, barley sugar. So when I first started flying in the 70s, um, used to give out barley sugar uh, when we got on the plane they'd dish, dish them out so um you know to get you to suck while you're on the taking off but um obviously she can't it was not a good idea to give sweeties and uh chewing gum and things like that so um not a you know rod. something that's very chewy that's probably not too bad for her uh, is a good idea and, and hope she doesn't notice that there's a change in pressure because they're I've been on a plane recently and it was very noisy because <laughs> there was a lot of unhappy little babies on Aww. the plane they're about one. I've been the mummy in that situation, and they um, they uh, it was a tiny weeny plane, and the the air crew were lovely, and they were going, oh, it's no problem, nobody can hear about hear your baby above the noise of the plane. And then I got off last because I had to get my pram off, my pusher off, and uh, everyone walked past, going, is your baby all right now? Is your baby all right? And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> like everybody knew. <laughs> it's a very stressful time, it's so awful, make it as easy but, as yeah, possible. Yeah, it's Hopefully not you've funny. Got someone helping you as well, Charlotte. And know that most every you know if you are a mummy in that situation know that other mums have been there too they know what it's like it is it is you know it is it's what it is stressful. it happens yeah, and we have to accept ignore it ignore everybody else and concentrate on on them um, how she's getting on on the plane and just yeah. be there for her mm. um good luck and have a fabulous holiday yeah enjoy so we've got uh jenna she says hello i commented last week in regards to milk supply during covid it def def definitely affected it massively oh i hope you're feeling better this week um and uh, massively since I've been been better, it's back to normal. I Brilliant. feel like breastfeeding women should be aware of this as there's nothing about it in the in on the internet. No, I mean it is, and everybody's different when they're, when they're poorly. And I think that, um, you know, mm. COVID has been such a big unknown. And, you know, we actually know that mothers, and we've had many, not many, but we've had quite a few incredibly sick women that have been, um, you know, really uh, intensively cared for, mm -hmm. and they don't produce any milk at all. Their milk just does not appear. You know, their body is too poorly to make milk. So, um, you know, we've learned an awful lot about everything about COVID and breastfeeding. Uh, very, you know, going in the dark and and finding out as it's happening. Yeah. So, um, you know, there there isn't an awful lot of documentation about feeding and COVID because, um, you know, people have been um, drowned with all the stuff that's going on just to keep their head above water so I think you know uh, being acutely ill or having um, any illness mm. so if you get flu we know that um, mums often lose their supply a little bit and people like La Leche leave and you know that you might find something on La Leche International or La Leche UK GB um, which will talk about acutely ill 
um, NCT might mention some of the things, but you might have to dig deep to find out that information sometimes. It may not just come up on a Google search. But yes, absolutely, you've got a really fair point there that, um, you know, if you're very poorly uh, and um, you're just, you know, keeping yourself going, then um, it may well affect your water supply. Mm, it may absolutely. well. Um, but it may not affect others, you know. And we've had, well, as you know, I mean, half the population's had COVID now, and um, quite a lot of those are breastfeeding mothers. So um, I think it's a stimulation. But the good thing is that it's come back. And that's because you were five months, I think you said, yeah. weren't you? So um, it means that uh, your supply is, is a memory, and so you can bring it back. But um, you know, it, it's preserving you, uh, and that's you know, it's a good enough reason sometimes just to have a bit of extra in the freezer. So when you do become poorly, you've got extra milk to give your baby as well. If you have a little bit of a supply in the fridge, so if you, you know, if you've got a full breast in the morning, it's maybe worth taking a bit of a bit off and putting it in the freezer because it lasts for about six months. And it just means that you've got a bit of a stash as well if you're poorly and you're um, not able to feed your baby or for some reason your car breaks down and you're not there, um, you know, you've got extra milk in the freezer. It's not saying I'd recommend that you do routinely to fill your freezer, but it might be worth having, a, you know, an extra couple of bottles in there that you know you can um, give you a bit of time uh, to give your baby more food if you don't want to um, use formula. So um, that's really great. Thank you so much for for um, telling us about that's that's really helpful and I'm so glad Jenna that you're feeling better because uh, it's such an unknown COVID and everybody is affected differently by it and some people don't notice and others are really poorly and, and there's no rhyme or reason why um, you know it, people are affected differently. Can so, we take over the reading? Yeah, I'm, I'm finally to. on. If you want to, <laughs> we'll go to Elle. <laughs> so Elle said, hi my 30 my 30 day old little boy started to become unsettled after breastfeeding and can smell acid on his breath. He's not bringing anything up but he's gaining weight well, yellow poos and weeing lots. First had reflux but didn't start this early. Uh, should I take him to the GP or see how things go for a few days? Any tips to manage this? So, 13 day days. old. Um, not bring anything up. Is it, is it acid or is it just very sweet breath from breastfeeding? Because yeah. newborn babies have got very sweet breath. I mean, it's worth having a conversation with your GP mm. if you have some concerns. Um, is there any uh, medical history in your family where you, you know you've got diabetics or anything? You know, or anybody in your family got that history? It'd be very unlikely that yeah. anything would happen at that that age. You know, he's a tiny, tiny little baby, um, and it sometimes baby's breath smells quite sweet. Um, so, you know, it might be that um, that it's just that and you're not used to that smell. But if you are concerned, I would, you know, strongly recommend that you have a conversation with your GP if you have those concerns. Um, you know, your baby's doing all the things it should be doing by the sounds of it. Pees and poos is normal and hopefully gaining weight okay. And the skin is a good colour, is it? And he's nice and alert and... Um, you know, looking around and waiting for feeds and all of those yeah, things. So she's is gaining yeah. weight, yellow you know, poos and weeing lots. Yeah, so. I mean, it sounds quite normal to me, but it might just be that it smells sweet to you because it, it's, um, you know, a breastfed baby and, and quite often they do have a very sweet breath. Yeah, you're saying it smells acidy though, don't you? Yeah, um, but you know, sometimes if it's like the hair droppy smell, that, that you that, that's how I understand it. But if mm. you have concerns, then you talk to your GP, maybe yeah. have a telephone conversation with your GP. Um, just to see that they're happy with everything um, and they know your family history as well so that's very important um, and it goes back to you know the um, if you're worried about your baby where to ring and get those um, that support yeah. when you need it so um, you know don't leave it till this evening ring this afternoon and have a conversation and just say can I speak to a GP my baby does I just want to put some concerns about him uh, and hopefully they'll reassure you Okay, I hope that helps and I hope everything is all right. Jane said, hi, I asked last week about my three month old baby sleeping for 10 hours overnight and you said to watch out about mastitis. I gave him a bottle before bed but I, but I pump before I go to bed and he sleeps for 10 hours at the moment. I always wake up soaked, what are the signs of mastitis? Uh, a very, um, very hard red breast or breasts um, that they'll feel warm. Um, and you might have, they might be, you know, there can be localised red, it could be red all over, and you'll, you'll feel quite unwell, as you said. You know? I mean, you will feel like you've been run over by a bus. You, it's, it's awful. That's, 
that's not an exaggeration. Every bone in your body will hurt. You'll be shaky, you'll have a very high temperature and you will not be able to move. I mean, you will not be able to move. You, yeah. You're so poorly, usually you can't even get to the doctors if you've got mastitis. Mm. You know, you're too poorly to get in the car and get to the, to the doctors. So, um, you know, it, it really is like a sledgehammer to your body. Um, and some people get less, uh, they're brewing mastitis, but it's normally just a blocked duct. And yeah. if you haven't got the mastitis symptoms with high temperature, shaky, body aching, uh, and unable to move, you literally would not pick a 50 pound note up on the floor in front of you. You could not physically do it, you wouldn't care. So, or a million pound, you would not be able to do anything with it. So um, that's mastitis. You might have got a blocked duct, which might be a bit red and um, you know, you haven't fed for a bit. That's not mastitis. It's probably potentially going to be mastitis yeah. if you don't do anything about it. Um, but it's not mastitis, uh, you know, that, that's very different. And if you get that mastitis uh, feeling, so we've got a theme today, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, if you get that mastitis feeling, you have to empty your breast. So if you've just fed your baby and it comes on, you get a pump out and you pump or you express by hand, but you have got to empty your breast. That's the crux of uh, milk removal is, is removal of symptoms. And if you remove that milk, the infl inflammation in your breast goes down and then you start to feel better. Um, but it can, uh, and we say infected mastitis, so you're more likely to get um, infection if you've got cracked nipples. Yeah. And um, so there's an entry for bacteria to get into your nipples. So if you've had breastfeeding problems, we've seen mums that have got lots of breastfeeding problems where their nipples have been um, you know, chomped on a bit by their baby and they've got a bit of damage. And then, uh, you know, just the daily um, body flora get into that crack and it tracks up the milk duct and, and creates an infection and, and that's often how mothers get in um, mastitis. The other one is the non-infectious um, mastitis which the symptoms are uh, identical. Yeah. You feel the same whether you've got an infected mastitis or a non-infected mastitis but it's unlikely that you've got um, bacteria infection uh, making you poorly if it's um, non-infective but you have the same symptoms it's very real and you feel very poorly and actually yeah. Other mammals um, are very, very poorly if they get mastitis, and farmers are terrified if their cows mm -hmm. get mastitis because it, it can make them very, very poorly. Um, but we manage it slightly different. We don't respond quite as badly to mastitis as, as humans. Um, but it, you know, um, so sometimes you don't need antibiotics when you have mastitis yes. because you can Good just point. empty your breast and it goes away. But what happens is if if your breast fills again and the same symptoms come back, then you definitely need to have antibiotics. But if you suddenly feel dreadful, you drain your breast and nothing else happens, you probably sorted it out. It's just an inflammatory response in your breast. But if it comes back when your breast fills or you've got very cracked nipples and you're sore, then it's probably an infection and you will definitely need some antibiotics. And you know, we, we give broad spectrum antibiotics. So um, it's things like flucloxacillin, that mm. is the ideal medication for um, mastitis. So if you can't take uh, penicillin for any reason, then you'd probably get something like erythromycin uh, to treat you. But actually the best antibiotic is a broad spectrum one, which is normally flucloxacillin tablets and you need a hospital dose. So you need a, a you know, a really high dose, not a um, one that, uh, you know, you might get if you've got uh, an infected finger or something like that. You, you would tend to get a very high dose of those medication to knock it on the head. But sometimes you need to take it uh, more than one course to get rid of the mastitis if it's very persistent. Um, but hopefully you start feeling better with the mastitis um, treatment and emptying your breast. So, but you know, there's lots of different types of mastitis. So you've got to look at the whole picture. And you know, Alec, we talked about that. If you slept longer, mm -hmm. um, you might have squished your breast, or you've got a, a different bra on, for mm -hmm. instance, or you've gone out and you've worn a costume, clothes that you wouldn't normally wear for breastfeeding, because you know your wardrobe changes when you breastfeed, doesn't it? You, everything, you have to go out after you've breastfed for about a week and buy a whole new set of clothes because you realise what you've got doesn't work. Um, but if you're going out and you suddenly put a new bra on or something, or you've, you're an hour late home, that's you know, also a risk of getting mastitis, um, as well as sleeping very heavily on one side. So, um, you know, don't sleep in bras that are a bit tight for you because yeah. that will make a, a big difference to your um, ducts if they're being compressed for a long time. And be careful when you're um, feeding, you know, because uh, sometimes, especially if you're sore, 
uh, you, you're holding your breath so tightly because you're sore that you're so tense. You don't realise you're doing it. You block your it. own ducts. You actually put your finger in the same place every time. Some people actually put a mark on their breast where they have to hold it so they know where to hold to get the right feed. You know, it's, it's very literal. Um, and if you do that every single feed eight times a day, you can block your own ducts as well. So be very careful when you're managing your breast that you're not blocking your own ducts um, because that's as equal as lying on it very firmly or... Um, wearing something restrictive it's the same if you're squeezing your breast in a certain place and often people get blocked up here because they've been holding their breast all the way through yeah. the feed because they don't move once their baby's on because they're worried that the baby will come off so you know it's about good positioning and attachment make sure that your breast is not moved when you put your baby on um, because uh, when you let go it shouldn't move again so a lot of people hold their breast up and they let go and then it falls out the baby's mouth when you yeah. let go. So if you just let your breast dangle where they should dangle, um, when you move your hand, nothing happens and your baby stays where it is. So it's really important that you don't hold onto your breast and move it to where it's not attainable because actually your breast is fixed. So um, that's the thing that shouldn't move and your baby is the thing that moves because it's movable. So um, don't make your breast come somewhere that, you know, don't try to put your breast over here, for instance, when it's over there, just leave it over there and feed your baby yeah. without your hands on it. Bring your baby to where it is, yeah. rather and than moving it. will be much it. more successful, yeah. Yeah. and you're much less likely to compress your ducts. I think the thing to take away from that is that, you know, some you can, some mums are aware that it's brewing, that they might be brewing a bit of mastitis, yeah. and that's where you do 24 hours self-help. So that's where you do paracetamol, ibuprofen, really effective milk removal if it's a thursday or friday then i would suggest you speak to the gp and you get hold of a prescription you don't have to go and get it put it on your side you just have it there ready just in case it doesn't resolve because if it doesn't resolve you start antibiotics it's always a friday night bank holiday weekend it, that people typical, get yeah. <laughs> so we would say if that's the situation phone the gp you know it's thursday or friday phone the gp because you haven't got that much time you want to see if you turn it around in 24 hours if you've turned it around in 24 hours you don't need to take antibiotics yeah. but if you haven't turned it around in 24 hours you need to be on those antibiotics or if you're feeling like naomi's mentioned you would go straight onto the antibiotics yeah. but there some people it's slightly more incremental and they're aware of it and unfortunately if you've had mastitis once it is thought that you are at increased risk of getting it again so being very aware of what to look for that redness that feeling you know feeling a bit off um you know bit warmth in the breast um you know get going get that milk moving ibuprofen because that's a great anti-inflammatory paracetamol make you feel better bring your temperature down mm -hmm. and then see how you get on and it might be that you've had a trauma in one of your ducts in your breast so you may have had a lumpectomy yeah. or um you know some some you might have got a cyst in your breast in one particular area and that can slow the um flow of milk in that duct and that can be enough to block it if you get a really full breast and you don't empty it and you've got um you know uh, lumpy breasts which most women get um, you know when they're um, menstruating they often have these lumpy breasts um, you know that that can be something that can um, affect the flow of milk in one duct only you know everybody is individual and you know if you've never breastfed you don't know but um, it's you know there's lots and lots of different reasons for it happening um, and the other thing is that if you start feeling better don't stop taking the ibuprofen no. you know because uh, it has got a long-term uh, build up. So the anti-inflammatory response of the ibuprofen takes a few days to build up and it stays there. So if you just take them when you feel like it, it doesn't have the same effect. You know, if you take them for a week, the anti-inflammatory response will, will help to, to protect your inflammatory response to the milk in the breast. So um, take it every time, so three times a day, um, and it's eight, uh, 400 milligrams three times a day so that uh, and take it every day even if you don't feel that you want to take it because things have got better because actually it's got better because you're probably taking the ibuprofen and it's stopping the inflammation as well so if you stop that then the symptoms sometimes come back so keep taking it so this links perfectly into jenny's next comment which was thank you so much um you're right it hit me all of a sudden i was fine and then felt awful i'll continue to take the painkillers and get the milk out thanks so much Hopefully that will knock it on yeah. the head. Alicia came, uh, Charlotte came back to say Alicia had a fat birthday, lots of presents, and she's loving life. Now Aww. she's two. Um, right, Jada said, and this might be a stupid question. There are no stupid questions. But I know babies are not allowed honey before one. Does that mean I shouldn't eat it whilst breastfeeding? No, you should be fine. You can eat it. Yeah, right. So the reason is because it's got botulism. 
uh, risk of botulism. And uh, I mean, many, many years ago when I started, we used to give uh, honey dummies to babies that were um, waiting for milk. Um, you know, a lot of the um, ethnic minorities that don't give, didn't give colostrum in the early days used to give honey dummies to their babies. Um, and we know a lot more about it now, but it's actually the risk of botulism. And Jenna's so. put another reason that actually makes an awful lot of sense. Jenna's replied as well, she said, I believe this is only because it's so thick it sticks to the baby's throat and makes them choke. I mean, there's some valid point to that. And that's that's a big dollop, yeah. Yeah, I've, that, I've, I've, I mean, I've not heard that before personally, but I, I, I knew about the botulism side of things, yeah. and actually there's a risk with it, and babies can't cope with it under the age of one. Yeah. Um, but actually what you're saying is also fairly valid as well. And I being think, gloopy yeah. mm, in large volumes. So if you give a teaspoon to a baby, you know, yeah. it's going to get stuck in its throat, because it is quite, when you take a spoonful of honey, it is quite strong, isn't it? Yeah. So um, yeah. Be very when Jane's careful. come back, she thought it was because of a disease they can get. So yes, I think you're on the same wavelength as us. But I think Jenna's got a good point too, actually. Mm. So that's quite interesting. Mm. Um, Charlotte's come back and she was saying she was thinking of biscuits or I'll treat her with some chocolate. Um, I, I wonder if it could be something a bit more chewy um, for the airline, or something that gets her going because you've got to get all She's the got to work on. yeah it's new station tubes you've got to try and keep clear so biscuits might not have quite enough chew in them unless it's a very chewy biscuit so you cut something up into tiny little pieces so she can have little pieces and not worry about her um choking on anything you know mm. but little tiny bits of something chewy would help uh just to keep her busy um while it's going up and coming down uh, but it's tiny little bits that she just needs yeah. to chew on for more than a couple of seconds and chocolate will melt very quickly yeah. and go everywhere. Yes. <laughs> She'll have, would... Whatever her nice clothes are for the holiday will not be nice clothes by the time <laughs> she arrives in Porto Ventura. <laughs> but I think, you know, something that is easy to handle and, um, you know, little pieces mm. of, and that will help. Now you, have, you have these great ideas, you think they're going to work. And, um, and they can backfire because I can remember taking my toddler thinking the only way I'm going to keep him still to have his hair cut is to give him a lollipop. What a mistake! <laughs> it was the hairiest lollipop ever. <laughs> it was horrible. So you have these ideas, you think, oh, this will work. No, it didn't. <laughs> it was so funny. Anyway, it was. Um, Kiara says, Hi, Alex and Amy. My baby girl is eight weeks old and can't be fed with express breast milk and a small amount of formula. And then on the breast, she'll only latch when I use nipple shields. I would love to be able to get rid of the shields as find them a real faff to get on in the middle of the night or when out in public. Every day I try to see if she'll latch without them. Tried removing the shield halfway through a feed and doing skin to skin, but she instantly becomes... I'm hoping there's a bit more. Um, I'm going to see if it comes up any lower. Frustrated and thrashes around, do you think she could possibly have a tongue tie or is she just used to the, to the um, teat? Well, it's more likely that she's just, uh, you know, addicted to her nipple shield. Yeah. And one of the things you can do is rather than waiting till half the feed when she's got her appetite has been, uh, you know, satisfied a little bit, just wait for the milk let down and get her into that, you know, three or four really big gloves. And then just literally you get the nipple shield and you pull it up and stick it there. And then in the same breath, you put her back on. So it's literally pull it up there, put her on. Yeah. And she doesn't realise that she's on and she's so hungry and into the feeding that she doesn't notice that it's not there. Um, the other thing that uh, is quite successful with nipple shields and taking them off and feeding is that you make um, a shape with your breast like that and you keep your fingers very close to the nipple. So you like make a sandwich like that. But, um, and you hold it and you push her on holding it and you don't let go because that makes it feel like a nipple shield. It feels really firm in her mouth and it doesn't looks so obvious if you leave it so that it's very soft but I would say make a real um, firm uh, teat shape and it's the only time you would be hands-on like this mm. when you're breastfeeding it's not something that we do unless you know you're trying to, to do something very specific and then just hold her on and don't take your fingers away for ages just keep them there for until you're really sure that she's got the rhythm of suckling and fool her into thinking that the shield is still there. Mm. But you have to do it quite quickly into the feed. You know, get the let down, get the milk flow, whisk it off and then bung her on really fast so that she doesn't notice, she hasn't almost taken a breath, literally. And if it helps, then make a shape at the same time. So you literally pull it off, bung it up there somewhere, <laughs> bung her on. So you're literally doing it that technical so term, fast, fast. <laughs> bung her on. And it literally is that, so you've literally have her here, she'd be feeding, you pull the shield off and you 
make the straight back on. Straight back on before you've even that you can't fiddle about. You just literally pull it off and bugger back on immediately. They get used to the feel of that firmness, which is why Naomi's saying if you firm up the breast tissue, they, they appreciate that. They mm. like that feel. If you think of the mouth, they like that feel of something firm in their mouth because that's what they've got used to. Different to if the they breast. hadn't had a shield, and you know, there are so many babies out there that do you know, feed without, if they hadn't had a shield, that's their norm. But what's become their norm is something a little bit firmer. And by firming up the breast tissue, you are providing them with that stimulation that they're looking for. And it's like you make a sandwich, so you literally make a sandwich, but it's really close to, you know, keep your fingers away from the nipple so she can get on, but you just literally keep your fingers there and hold the nipple in that shape. She, and she'll get, she'll move to feeding without a shield when she's ready. Yes. And that's the problem. We we like to think we can be in control, yeah. but you can't. In it's terms. totally up to her when she decides she's prepared to feed without a shield. And we say this to parents. I say I always say to parents, there are two things to be worried about. One, whether it impacts on your milk supply, which is why we would never use shields at under, sort of, well, before the milk comes in. We would not recommend them at all before the milk comes in. Um, because when no. it's colostrum, you're not going to stimulate the supply. And two, that actually it's in charge, the baby's in charge. The baby will tell you when they're ready to feed without them. You can keep trying, but they'll only do it when they're ready. So, and that's the problem with it. And that's, that's, a, that's a great place for them. Oh, and, fantastic. And I think if, you, if you've been giving your baby bottles a lot of the time, then plastic is the driver for your baby mm. to feed that's what they're used to feeling. So, um, you know, the next step is if you're trying to get them off bottles onto the breast and they won't do that, you can use a nipple shield yeah. to get them back onto the breast and then you take the nipple shield off. But, you know, they do get addicted to them and um, it might be that it's six months. I mean, but thank, don't worry about it. thank goodness for them because many a baby out there is feeding yeah. via a shield that wouldn't be feeding at the breast yeah. at all. And that means that mums can drop pumping, which is just fabulous yeah. I and mean, it's very liberating. I know it's a faff dealing with a shield, but it's it's less of a faff than having to keep pumping, and that's what we say to mums. So and I bet but, when you had the shield on, you were absolutely <laughs> thrilled yeah. that she was breastfeeding, yeah. and then yeah. like 48 yeah. hours later, you think, right, I want to get rid of this. But that's got to be in her terms. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, but well done you, because you, you know, regardless fantastic. of whether you're using shield or not, you're breastfeeding, which is absolutely brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyway, Jade had to go and pick up the kids from school, so she's going to come and join us later. She's written, I have to come back and watch it later, she said. So. Uh, if you got to school on time, I've just chucked out one of our team members. I literally went and relieved her on the ward. She was still in the ward, and I think she's got to leave. She's got kids to pick up from school. She said she'd already been late once this week. So yeah, so I'm getting a black mark from the school. I chucked her out the door. <laughs> I went and took over. Anyway, um, Kiara said, becomes frustrated. Oh, oh, I did that bit because that was in two bits, wasn't it? I've already said that. You wondered if it could be a tongue tie. Um, well, not necessarily. It's just that she's used to using a shield. Um, you know, that, that isn't necessarily a link between um, feeding via a shield or not feeding um, at the breast without a shield being tongue-tied. So um, you I, could I, go to ABS and just get them to support you if you want to take yeah. the shield off, and uh, and then they could look at the way she feeds when she's on the breast without it, and that will tell you, you know, how well she's doing. Mm. Um, be wary that if she goes onto the breast without nipple shield, the flow of milk is much faster, 30% more more flow. Um, than it with a nipple shield so she will find it quite overwhelming if you've got a lot of milk mm. to suddenly find that there's milk pouring into her mouth that she hasn't quite experienced before so um, you know give it a little bit of time for her to settle into it before you start thinking is it this um, and you know if, if you do think it's a problem and you're sore again um, then uh, you know go and talk to your health visitor and see if they'll do a well, moral assessment for we've you. got a bit more information because Kiara said that um, she had a lot she had very severe jaundice when she was young so she when the baby was first sleepy. born lots of difficulty getting into latch which is because they're so sleepy um, and so that's why you ended up introducing a bottle of express breast milk so you've done absolutely yeah. what you needed to do you know that's, that's right. completely what we would be recommending yeah. and hopefully in time she'll go okay it's much nicer without yeah. without a shield and she'll get it Okay, right. But you know, just be aware that she might get a bit overwhelmed when the suddenly she gets milk and she'll notice, which is sometimes why holding your breast, it just keeps the flow as well uh, down a bit. Um, and so they, they learn to deal with that. But, um, you know, learn to breastfeed her without it before you start looking for problems because it just might be that she was a bit sleepy in the early days with jaundice. And that's all it was. Um, Elle's just come back about responding to what we were chatting earlier. She said, if everything else is fine, she, then she'll call the GP. Well, that's good news. Well done. Right, Tyre said, if you're colostrum harvesting and aiming to breastfeed, would you suggest using nipple creams prior to baby arriving to help prepare, or would it not make a difference? It makes no difference, so don't bother. No, we, 
you only need your nipple cream if you're sore. So, you know, it's yeah. just from that point of view, it's we only need to, to put something on there if you've got a bit sore. So, you know, many mums will buy the cream and hopefully many of them won't ever use it. Mm. But, you know, don't worry about it. And if you get some sort of pure lanolin type um, cream, you can use it on their bottoms as well. So you don't waste the tube. But if you yeah. buy nipple cream, often it's not um, as good for their bottoms. You know, it's got other things in it which might you might not want to put on your baby's bottom. So, um, you know, if you get a pure uh, cream, uh, like lanolin base, unless you're allergic to wool. Yeah. And I don't think people realise that sometimes if they're, mm. you know, if you're very sensitive to wool and you can't wear wool, you might find that your nipples get sore with the lanolin cream yeah. because uh, you're sensitive to it. Um, so it might be that you need another pure nipple cream that's not lanolin based. Um, so uh, just be aware of that. And if anyone's listening and finding that they've got sore, you know, where they're putting the cream, it's a bit red. It might be that you're sensitive to the lanolin, which is sheep. Basically, it's wool. Yeah. So um, you know, if you don't, if you're allergic to wool on your skin, you might be sensitive to lanolin. Try and see. Right, that was Ty. Becky has said, my baby's now nine weeks and had her tongue tie divided three weeks ago, but is still feeding for long periods of time, 40 to 90 minutes, and every one and a half to three hours, which also means she doesn't have long stretches of sleep. Is this normal? Uh, probably longer feeds. Uh, what you don't say is whether that you're offering both sides. So, you know, we anticipate a feed is somewhere between five and 40 minutes on each side. So. 5 and 40, five, between 5 and 40, between 5 and 40. So you can imagine if you both both sides are taking up to 40 minutes, mm. you're well over an hour, well over. Um, but you would expect your baby to be settled if it's had a good long yeah. feed. You don't want to then start again when you've just finished. Your baby should be settled in between. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, have you been to get breastfeeding support since you've had your craniotomy? Uh, because, uh, you know, if your feeding wasn't great before and you were struggling to breastfeed, positioning and attachment is the key. So, you know, sometimes you don't see the difference because your positioning and attachment needs some attention as well. So it might be worth booking in something like OBS or your health visitors to see if they can um, support you with a latch uh, because your baby's nine weeks old. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, go to your local breastfeeding support, wherever that is, the nearest one to you, and book in a session with them. Uh, and just see if they can watch your positioning to see if they can improve that. Um, you know, and just remember that uh, it's a bit like if you've never run a marathon and, and you get your, um, you know, you go out and start trying to run a marathon without doing any training, uh, your legs are tired and you can't quite do it. And, and you know, your babies have their tongue snip, the muscles change, and they've got to learn to use the muscles and build those up again to feed. So they do get very, very tired post brainulotomy and they have to build that up. And, and obviously you've been feeding for, for um, you know, six, well, six weeks, weeks prior to, the having, prior it to having it done. And, and so they've worked their muscles in that way and then the muscles are snipped. You know, the tongue changes its muscle um, form and uses different muscles to feed because the accessibility to those muscles is now available with the tongue being snipped. And so they've got to build that muscle up again. So, um, you know, we say at least a month to see improvement. But um, you know, if you need good support with breastfeeding, go back and get good positioning and attachment support to see if that um, they can improve that because that will make feeding um, more efficient if they're on the breast more effectively, and it might shorten the feeds a little bit. But uh, you know, you've had quite a journey to get to nine weeks, so well done you. That's that's hard work. Okay. Um. Kiara's come back so thank you. Heba has said, and this is just carrying on the theme today, it's a mastitis theme. Um, good afternoon ladies, I think I may have developed mastitis, hard painful lump on one breast and flu-like symptoms. My baby's almost six months and I've been exclusively breastfeeding with no issues before. I was surprised because I thought mastitis mainly happened in the first few weeks or when there's a sudden change in demand, e.g. when weaning. I wondered what the cause could be and also what I can do to relieve it. So mastitis can strike you at any point. Yep. Um, and uh, it's probably more likely a bit later on when you've sort of relaxed your feeding or they start sleeping longer. So 
that's one of the reasons is baby sleeping longer. So if you've got babies that are going longer periods of time and not removing milk, so either they're sleeping longer or they, you know, because you're starting to introduce other foods that they're going longer, you know, maybe not looking for so much food. Um, it's being aware of your breasts. It's making sure that there's good milk removal. If you're not trying to push your milk supply, it's making sure your breasts stay comfortable. You're not having to drain them as such. So you want to keep your breasts comfortable at all times. And as we mentioned earlier, paracetamol and ibuprofen are great first line remedies um, alongside effective milk removal. Um, and you should see, because you said you've got a hard lump, you should see that resolve fairly quickly. Things you can also do is when you're pumping, like I see that in the picture that was down there. <laughs> and when you're pumping, if you imagine having you, you, you've got a pump on, you're holding it on with your fingers, is that you work the area that is sore. So yeah, exactly. So hold it there. Is that if you've got if the area is here, so you gently work that area. Don't be hard on it. Be gentle. Nice rhythmic rounds or something or stroking. I was chatting to a couple yesterday and they've been struggling with a lump in the breast and she'd been using a, a comb, which many people do. Um, and if you look online, they'll say things like electric toothbrushes. Yeah, it's things to just just to get it moving. Be nice. Don't be really firm because actually all you do is displace that milk. It's milk that is, you know, yeah. ca it's caught up. It's milk that you then put into the tissue around and it will make it worse. So be kind and gentle to yourself. Gentle movements on there, helping to get the milk moving. And remember that food is for fun before one. So um, the primary source of food for uh, your baby when you're weaning them is, is breast milk still. And you always breastfeed first and give them food afterwards so that they drain the breast properly. So don't give food first and then give a breastfeed. Make sure you give the breastfeed, then you offer them food. It's for fun before one. And actually, you know, breastfeeding would be brilliant. Get your baby on that breast, get them moving yeah. the milk, because babies yeah. tend to be much, much better than a pump. And even if you can, you know, get the chin the, the chin in against the affected area. So we've been, you know, we've, we've supported mothers to feed, you know, with their head over, the, body over the shoulder so get that chin in there against the that case, area. It goes all the way yeah. around so I would know. say that yeah so babies can be anywhere anywhere on that clock face so but, um, but yeah, you so know don't oh. substitute uh, a breastfeed for, for solids you know so always give a breastfeed first then offer the solids and um, and then they will drain the breast effectively because you know it's often when you start messing about with your breastfeeding so you're introducing something different they sleep longer you're wearing different clothes you start um, giving them more food, um, you know, all of those things can trigger mastitis. Yeah. So, um, you know, just make sure that you're aware of, of what happens. And, and, you know, sometimes you get these little plugs in your nipple as well, what we call white spots or plug ducts. Um, and that's often when the composition of the milk changes. And some people are more prone to them than, yet, than other people. And so um, it's when the milk becomes a little bit more oily or fatty or it has more minerals in it. Um, and you may have got some slightly irregular um, surface on the ducts, which, you know, is a variation of a normal. Um, it can just clog up the ducts and get caught on it. And so this sort of more um, fatty composition of the breast milk, because your baby's needs are changing, uh, can sometimes just plug the duct and get stuck in the duct. And uh, then you get a backlog because there's a, pl you know, there's a plug at the end, the milk doesn't come out and you don't notice it for a while because the milk's coming out of all the other ducts. Um, there's a build up, you know, it's a bit like a dam and it backs up. So um, sometimes that's why it happens as well. So, um, you know, look at your nipples, see if you can see a little white spot or anything, do some hand expressing sometimes and that will mm. um, target the area that you're feeling a little bit lumpy. Target that area and hand express behind the nipple. So, you know, I know what you're going to say. You'd go Heimlich maneuver, that's what you would say, isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, if you've got a rump lump, you do yeah. need to do Heimlich maneuver. It literally is. A bit of welly behind it but actually if you think that it's forming you can see quite often just a little white spot on the end of your nipple and that's not the milk coming out it looks like a little bleb um, and so have a little look and just see if you if you flare your nipple out so it's not you don't often see it when the nipples sort of normal but if you flare the nipple out when you're um, just um, squeezing it gently you can sometimes see a little dot on one of the ducts and that might be what it is and you can sometimes just remove it it really um, is removed by breastfeeding got to say it, you know it doesn't tend to move away but you might suddenly notice your baby's fussing on one side and they're not getting the flow out of all the ducts and there's many ducts in your nipples you know sometimes there's four sometimes there's none um, you know sometimes there's other 
it depends on who you are. You're not going to get more one day and less the next, but you know, each Just, woman has yeah, different woman. numbers. Yeah. Um, and so your baby, if you haven't got many ducks, might notice more readily if you've only got four ducks and three, one of them stops working, they may notice that the duck is not um, giving them milk in the same way. And they, babies are very flow driven. And so you might notice that before you notice the lump. So, uh, you know, if they're fussing and pulling at the breast when they're feeding, just do a little bit of, um, you know, check, self-check to see what's going on, or does it feel a bit more lumpy in one area? But it does, it feels quite bruised when you've had a, a plug duck and you clear it. And it you know, it, it really is um, just sort of, um, and it would develop into mastitis or an abscess if you don't drain it. Okay, I hope that helps, Heber. I hope it helps, yeah. yeah. We've always got so much to say. There's been a real theme today, Miss Titus. Um, Bianca, hi ladies, thank you thank for your help as always. We've almost reached five months of exclusive breastfeeding, hoping to continue as long as possible. Ooh, it's a way off yet, but when my little one goes to nursery in January, will I need to pump during the day to protect supply? Or will it be enough to feed before and after nursery? It depends what you want to do. So, you know, some mums cope. How many days are they going to nursery? That's the other thing. You know, yeah. if it's one day a week, you probably won't notice so much. But if it's five days a week, you, you might will. Do, yeah. And your supply will drop. Um, so, you know, it's individual, as Alex says. Mm. You know, and, and it is, it depends what you want to be doing at that point. You know, you'll be a year then, which is fabulous. You've done a great job. Um, you know, many mums cope with just morning and night feeds, but you might like your baby to have some milk in the day. And initially, when you first go back, you probably will need to. And often what we find is babies that are at nursery, um, they ask for less food during the day, well, I'll look for a bit more at night. So they sort of check in with mum and ask for mm. more then. Um, and um, they, they tend to ask for less um, because it's not coming in the normal way. So you might find that evenings and weekends and nights, you're doing more feeding than you have been doing previously because your baby's gonna make up for it. And it's a fabulous way of checking in for that your baby to check in with you to make sure you're there and ready for them. Um, and it's, it's a lovely thing that you can do that nobody else can. You know, it's very much your unique relationship, which is so nice. So I'd love to see how it works out and what's happening feeding wise when you get there. You know, and, and say if it's only one day a week, then it's not so bad. You can sort of do that, or if it's for a morning rather than a whole day, then um, you know you can manage it. But uh, every baby's individual, and many great babies only breastfeed morning and evening at one. Mm. You know, but they can keep doing that until they're whatever, two or three, or beyond, or beyond, or indeed. Yeah. So um, you know, it's normal for you and for your baby. It's very personal breastfeeding, and, and it's nobody else's business really. Uh, it's what's working for you as a family. Right, well, the next person is our colleague. Oh, really? <laughs> Sarah says, it's fine for mums, she's on the botulism thing, she's fine for mums to have honey while breastfeeding. Uh, babies under one year old should not have honey or foods processed with honey due to the possibility of it carrying botulism causing spores. So that comes Thank from you, our Sarah. colleague. She's another <laughs> one of the infant feeding team. She doesn't work Thursday, she doesn't get to do this. Um, and uh, so she's she's just reiterated what we've said. So we at least we all agree as a team, so Brilliant. which is good news. That's very helpful. So, mm. <laughs> yeah, and I hadn't thought about that actually because what um, she said there is um, foods processed with honey. So I suspect it would be, be if they haven't had any form of pasteurisation or something, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Taya has said, thank you. Um, I'm sensitive to wool and have to avoid otherwise. And I have skin reactions. I never knew this. I appreciate that. So well done for giving her the heads up on that one. Yeah. So and you I can try it and see, just put a little bit on your skin and see what happens, but um, you know, just be aware of that. Um, apparently Alicia has woken up and is now waving at us both. Now that was 11 minutes ago, but so sorry. Hello Alicia, have a lovely holiday. <laughs> so, so enjoy that. Um, and she's trying to talk to us as well. <laughs> Um, up with us, hasn't yeah. She? Bianca says thank you. It's three days of nursery a week um to start with, yeah. so we'll see how we go on. Yeah, it's gonna be very much definitely take your pump with you to work. Is it definitely. every other day or is it three days in a row? That's the million dollar question because you will impact your supply if it's for three days in a row. Possibly, unless you're pumping. Unless, unless you're pumping. pumping. Yeah. yeah. And you know the thing is, we talked about this last week as well. Is being aware that you have a right to pump. Um, you know, You're it's, yeah, it becomes a slightly more grey area once the baby gets to one. But you still, your employer should support you beyond six months. Um, they should, they should support you with a lockable room and access to a fridge. 
Um, so start those negotiations good and early, um, unless you're, um, you're working from home, it would be no issue at all these days, so many people do work from home. But if you go out to work, I would start those negotiations good and early yeah. um, about ensuring that they are able to provide you with those facilities um, and a good employer really should. Um, and on that note, you know, for instance, we've just organised, we've had a room here in um, the Women's Centre for our staff that are returning, expressing, yeah. but it's just had a nice revamp. I mean, it could still be nicer, but it's much better than it was with two fabulous new pumps and a lovely chair. Um, and so, we, you know, we, we're trying to look after our staff and all employers should be looking after their staff if they're returning to work and they're still feeding their babies. So, so just, yeah, you know, have, really that, have that discussion. And maternity Alliance, yeah. will, you know, you can go to them um, online and they will uh, give you your legal side of it, you know, if, yeah. if your employer is being difficult. Um, because a lot of employers will say use the toilet and have to have Not it in your meal break. So if you're, ba if, you're, if you're going to work for six months, um, by law, they have to provide you with all the things Alex has talked about by law, because a baby should be exclusively given breast milk until it's six months old. Mm. So beyond six months, then it's slightly different. Um, but no employer should have the sense to uh, suggest that you go to pump in a toilet. I mean, there is no logic to that at all. So, but they should make it, uh, you shouldn't really be having it in your um, meal breaks either. You know, it should be on top of them, but um, by law, you're protected before six months on that one. So, you know, if you're pumping um, when she's at nursery, then, um, you know, you'll have a little stash for when she goes to nursery the next day. Mm. Uh, which is good, you're collecting milk for her, and then she'll keep the supply going for when she needs it. it and, and it might damp down if you if you don't pump quite so um, consistently, then your supply will damp down a little bit, and it'll gradually go down if you're not doing the same as she was feeding. So be aware of that as well. Okay, so Heba has said, uh, thank you for the suggestions. My baby sleep hasn't really changed, and I haven't started him on solids yet, so it may be just that I need to revisit my positioning and attachment. Also, a plugged duct, oh, Julie just jumped. <laughs> um, plugged milk duct sounds likely. I'm planning to start him on solids soon, so that it's extremely useful to know refeeding him before offering solids. Yeah, always, always. Yeah, because that's the majority and of their nutrition. nutrition. Mm. Um, can you tell me we worked together a long time? <laughs> <laughs> Bianca says three days in a row, so we'll be sure to take pump with me. Thank you. Yeah. And you remember your milk is fine at room temperature for up to six hours. So, you know, yes, it would be great. It's great to get it in the fridge, but don't, you know, it's not the end or if, if it isn't. So ideally get it in a fridge if you can. Have a cool bag with you. Yeah, and if you've got a cool bag, it should be okay. That would be yeah. probably fridge temperature for eight hours yeah. if you've got, you know, freezer blocks in it. Yeah. And it's a good one. Um, you know, if you're pumping in the morning and you're at work for eight hours, you probably, if you've got a cool bag, it would be okay till you get home Yeah. if it's cold. Um, but if you have just if you haven't got any cool bag, then it's six hours out on the side. So um, uh, you know, just be aware of that. But you might want to take a cool bag bag with you um, when you are doing it to collect it. Oh, and the final one on here is a thank you from Jade. So um, oh, I think we've done all the questions, and it's fantastic. thirty minutes past. Yeah, fantastic questions. Anybody, anybody again. else? Anything else? Anyone? Any more? <laughs> Um, we were going to talk about a bit about formula very briefly, weren't oh, we? Oh yes, I just wanted to say um, that anybody who is formula feeding, if you've got friends who are formula feeding, just you know, we're very, very aware that household incomes are being really quite impacted by um, the increasing costs in the shops at the moment and salaries not keeping up with those increases. And that just to remind you know anyone who's watching who eat, who uses formula or anyone who's got friends who are using formula, that to say that all formulas are the same. Um, I know I've said it before, but it becomes more and more pertinent when you think that you can spend, you know, a huge amount of milk, um, amount of money on formula milk, and actually you could be, you know, you or people you know could be buying the cheapest brands, and the cheapest brands still have to have the same nutrition. So whether you're buying a cheap brand or an expensive brand, the nutrition is the same. It has the same nutritional value. It has to by law. You're not getting anything better if you spend no. more. So. You know, with people finding the impact on their pockets at the moment, you know, going for a cheaper brand is not doing their baby a disservice. Mm. And, you know, there will be people out there who are going to be struggling going forward with the increases in costs on everything. And formula milk is going up too. And um, there's a very, very good organisation called First Steps Nutrition, which we've mentioned numerous times on this. Um, but. They
they've just put out a press statement and it says that now with the way the formula milks are working only one formula milk is covered by the price of the healthy start vouchers so if you think about all the array of formulas that are out there healthy start vouchers are there to help families that are you know struggling with money and only one of the formulas is is within the eight pound fifty that healthy start is um you know the, the cost of a healthy start voucher mm. so you know take if you're formula feeding or you know people are formula feeding, can you just remind them that they don't need to buy expensive? That's no better. Mm -hmm. They all have to meet government requirements. They are all just as good as each other and they can buy a cheaper brand. And you can swap brands. People have it in their heads. You can't. That's the most amazing marketing ploy. Um, you can. You can swap brands. I wouldn't recommend that you have one brand one week, one brand the next. But if you, you run can. out and you have to, uh, all they've got is one brand in the shop and you've run in to get an emergency supply, um, it's fine to buy a different brand. Yeah. Your baby will be absolutely fine on that. Um, so, uh, you know, don't worry about that. But don't be um, sucked into thinking that if you pay more, you get better. Yeah. Because, um, you know, it's it's not. Uh, and they are formidably expensive sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just think logically about it and look at what you can afford. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, if you are on, on the Healthy Start vouchers, then, you know, the consideration is that um, it won't always cover it. Uh, if you're looking at the expensive, more expensive brands, and they're not, and they're not, you know, they're not they're better. Not, yeah, they're not exactly. better. So they've just got more marketing. So, um, Lily has said, um, "Hi, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, thanks for all your explanations. Such a question, probably very basic. How to stop to produce milk? It tends to recommend why, spending yeah, gradual. Why do you want to do yeah. it? You so, know, is it because you're um, having to go somewhere tomorrow, or you're, you know, you're." And some people have to do it because they're on medication or you're wanting to wean off because you're going back to work or um, you know your baby's got teeth and we talked about that last week yeah. didn't we? and you're not it's not working for you depends but it's the, the more gradual the better it's more comfortable for you yes yeah, so reducing milk supply over a period of time and certainly when I was used to be an NCT breastfeeding council we would say dropping a feed a week so you give your breast a chance because we've talked lots and lots about mastitis today. If you do it too quickly, the likelihood is you will get mastitis. Yeah, that's so, really awful. Yeah, so you need to keep keep some movement in the milk. You can't leave the breast to get too full. It's going to make you feel very unwell. It'll be very uncomfortable. So it is a case of gradually reducing the milk. So you know if it's you know if, if you know that you want to stop over a period of time, give yourself a number of weeks in which to do so. Keep take it off till you're comfy yeah. so you know if you if you're wanting to reduce the, the amount and you're not doing so much breastfeeding but you want to reduce the amount because you're giving bottles instead then if your breasts feel full take a bit off don't yeah. empty them exactly take a bit off so you don't get mastitis um, and and that might only be five mils it might be ten mils um, but you know if you're normally giving your baby a big bottle of breast milk when you're expressing say or you're a big breastfeed um, you're wanting to just take it off till you stop feeling that fullness mm -hmm. and then what happens is you, you dump the, the supply down, as Alex yeah. talked about. So um, don't drain your breasts every time. If you're wanting to stop, you've got to dump it down a bit, but do it gradually, very gradually. And you might find that you need some microprofen as well if you're finding that you're very sensitive to um, supply in the breasts. But very gradual, and the more gradually, gradually you do it, the more comfortable you'll be and the, the more successful it will be probably. Yeah. Don't take something like Epsom salts, which is what we used to tell mothers well, to do in the 50s. Never heard of that. Never heard of it. We used to get Epsom salts because it Ooh. really is explosive, uh, you know, not in your breasts. Um, and uh, it dehydrates you massively. Uh, and so the dehydration, it's a bit like being really poorly. Uh, it just stops your breast producing milk. Mm. And that's very, very unpleasant. So don't let your granny tell you to do that. Or <laughs> never heard because, of it. Because uh, that might be what she did in, in her day. Uh, but you know it's not really what you should be doing it's gradual so that was for Lily hope that helps um, Charlotte has said that she's gonna be watching us from next to the pool next week don't make oh, us jealous no. it's a good thing we can't see a picture <laughs> Natalia has said hello I've got a four-week-old baby I'm breastfeeding and she's suffering a bit with colic mainly in the evenings me and my partner do tummy massage to help is there any natural remedy that you can help prevent colic thank you I'm wondering, you know, yeah. and I'm also wondering if it's colic or whether it's typical, um, you know, um, oh, what's the word, 
feeding in the evenings. So lactose, lactose. Yeah, but also, you know, lots of babies do cluster feeding in the evenings. Lots mm. of babies want to be constantly on the mm. breast for an hour, two hours at night, which is really, really common. Um, and then there's no satisfying them. They just want to be on the breast. Um, so it might be that. But yes, positioning and attachment. If it's colic, it's um, in a colic in a breastfed baby, we always go back to positioning and attachment. I mean, if you're getting green frothy poos, then that's probably what it is. If the poos are still yellow, um, then it, less likely to be that, more likely to be that it's just a baby that's cluster feeding. So, um, and the reason they get a little bit unsettled with that one is that if you know, you're know you on off the breast all evening, which is what they all do, mm. um, particularly first time mums, second time mums are too busy putting other babies to bed <laughs> to sit and do it. So you know they make sure the baby's fed, but make sure your baby has a really good feed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know drains the breast then change your baby's nappy uh, offer another side and then you know try not to do too many feeds uh, if it's you know really on off on off on off but what happens is they get sort of over stimulation of the lactase and lactose so they get loads of lactose which is what uh, is in the first quenching bit of the milk so when you first put your baby on the breast it's full of lactose um, and that's what's in breast milk it's predominantly lactose so um, you know, babies aren't lactose intolerant because they'd be incredibly poorly if they were. So they take in lots and lots of lactose over and over and over again. And the lactase, which is the enzyme in the baby's tummy, can't deal with breaking it all down. Uh, and so um, they uh, have a gas buildup. It's actually hydroperoxide because you've got hydrochloric acid in your tummy, the baby has. And uh, so uh, it's hydrogen peroxide, which is fizzy. And so they get this really tummy achy gas and explosive poos and uh, bringing their knees up and all the things that all of you are shouting and saying yes my baby does that mm -hmm. but actually if you improve the latch even a millimeter you know and you get and we haven't done this but have we I'm just going to point out it's 1538 though oh and I promise to go and see, it, do a, see a baby um, at four so you just we'll make sure that you line your baby up correctly so go and get your baby's feeding checked because sometimes a millimeter in a different direction means that um, your attachment is better and that sometimes stops the baby coming on and off and having lots and lots of the um, lactose which doesn't fill them up as much as the fat so if they get lots and lots and lots of that their tummy fills up but they feed frequently so um, it's it's a common thing that that mums get uh, caught up in but if you just tweak the attachment um, they can drain the breast and get the right mix and they get a little bit more fat and the baby then has chocolate pudding as well as uh, soup and main meal and so um, they're often more settled. So do get that position and attachment checked because um, lactose, lactose um, imbalance is very common and it makes mm. parents and babies very unhappy and it's very easily remedied if you've got slightly um, out of sync positioning and attachment. And remember that when your baby is growing, you've got to still keep those principles in place. So you've got to make sure that your baby moves into the right place still and you you know you're not holding your baby in the same way slightly at four weeks as you were at one week because they're slightly bigger so just make sure your baby moves with them as they grow Absolutely. so that you get a really good attachment and you're in the right place so get that attachment checked again just make sure it's right because that is sometimes all it is and it just transforms you in the evenings uh, it's most likely to be that with just slightly uh, tweak positioning and attachment and that um, unsettled me. Right, Melanie snuck another question in. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. <laughs> Last one. She goes, hi ladies, my baby's now seven months and he's going to his nanny's on Saturday night for a sleepover for the first time away from us. Wow. I've been breastfeeding and bottle feeding breast milk and formula. He tends to breastfeed every two to four hours depending on how he's feeling. Each day is different. He's also having two meals a day, breakfast and lunch, which he loves. I've got formula for my mum to give him Saturday as I can't express enough. Rega regards me, shall I just express every four or when I feel heavy? Yeah. I'll be back with him Sunday, mon mon Sunday morning lunchtime. Regards formula, shall I go four hours with that? He's only ever had one bottle of formula to go to sleep at night and sleeps better. I think pump when you would normally have fed him. Yeah. You want to keep your supply going. So pump when you normally would feed him and then you won't have any problems. Yep. and you'll have a little bit of extra so next time you want to baby uh, have him baby so yep. you've got milk in the freezer yeah you won't then. have to give it then yeah you don't have to give formula yeah so, so um, just when you would normally breastfeed him then do a bit of pumping it's not much of a break for you is it if you <laughs> you will need to do that because if you sleep through you'll end up with mastitis yeah if you normally if you normally breastfeed at night uh, you will need to pump when, yeah. you, when you're normally breastfeeding lucky granny you will. lucky you <laughs> yeah, lucky time yeah yeah, keep your rest comfortable. So you know, if you pump, as Naomi says, when it's when you would have been feeding, 
and then um, and then you know sort of be aware if you might need to do it again. So it's no hard and fast rules. I wouldn't keep to timing specifically though. Um, Round about. Yeah. I've just seen three more questions come up. Right, we're going to quick, we'll quickly whip through them then. Um, <laughs> so Natalia said, poo is yellow, and yes, in the evening she wants on-off feeding, so that's very normal. Thank you. Oops, another one's just dropped in. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. I'll get the latch checked. Brilliant. Go yeah. for it, Natalia. Um, always room for improvement on yeah, the latch. Yeah, always. Melanie says, thank you, that's great. That's what I thought, um, so you've just confirmed it. Thank you. Yeah. Charlotte says she's nervous flyer, so it will be fun. Oh dear. You'll be too busy yeah. to worry. Yeah, you'll be busy looking after Alicia. Yeah. And Melanie's gone, Nanny's very excited. Well, she's oh, a very brave nanny, and you were a lucky girl to have her. Having so, your precious cargo. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy. So it's amazing. Right, we're going to sign off now, because um, we're still going to get on to the wards. We're not going to pay over time on yeah. Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, save your questions for next week we'll look forward to seeing you then um, and I'm really sorry I promised I'd talk about biting this week but I didn't get a chance to read the information so I'll have a read and we'll bring it up next week have a good week okay. and have a fabulous holiday okay. bye, bye.